Thanks. Um, welcome to this class. Um, so today we'll continue doing graphical models. Actually, a fair amount of them. Um, we'll mainly be focusing on directed graphical models. Touch upon undirected graphical models a little bit, mainly to show you that actually, in terms of tools, it's very very similar. So we'll do conditional random fields a bit, and then in the end we'll start moving towards stuff that we've been working on for the past three to four years at Yale, how to push graphical models to a much, much larger scale than what you would usually find. So as in, you know, using them on, you know, billions of documents as opposed to just, you know, a few thousand documents in, you know, in this paper. Um, but before we get there, I just want to cover the basics a little bit more. And again, please do ask if something's not clear. And I'm more than happy to explain stuff on the whiteboard. <coughs> so last time some people told me they liked that I explained stuff on the whiteboard. Look, this is good. The only thing is you need to actually ask me. Because otherwise, I mean, uh, you know, why should I explain something that's not already on the slides if you don't ask me? So you really need to ask in order to get you know, more information to such that I also know what is clear and what isn't clear. Anyway, so let's just have a look at hidden Markov models. I mean, they are one of the most versatile and actually conceptually very, very simple structures that you can find in terms of modeling. So you get them in many cases when you have, you know, sequential data of some kind. So you might have, for instance, time series data. You might also have, you know, documents. Basically anything where you can line things up in order and where in addition to all the things that you observe, you have something else that's going on behind the scenes and you just don't know exactly what it is, but if you knew, life would be so much easier. So, to just compare clustering and hidden Markov models, you'll see that those two are actually very, very similar, right? So in clustering, we basically had, you know, our, so and I apologize, the X's and Y's will be a little bit mixed up on those slides, but. I think you can easily extrapolate from that. Um, so, you know, I have some latent variables which, you know, govern, you know, which cluster really to draw from, and then I observe something, right? That's basically clustering. In a hidden Markov model, all I'm assuming is that I can line up those unknown latent variables in a sequence, and that they actually depend on each other in that sequence. That's really the only difference that I'm going to make to simple clustering. Right. For, more specifically, if I knew all the latent variables, building a model for the observed ones would be really easy. And that's the case both in clustering and in mark models. So last week, we covered basically how we can run a variational method, so EM in this case, to obtain a good estimate of you know observed given latent. And we will actually go and recycle that very thing again here. So the difference is basically that here we just have a plate where all the x and y terms, you know, just come out well conditionally independent condition on you know whatever prior we have. And here all that happens is that just you know the current latent state affects the next one. And that's really the entire difference. So what would you use something like that for? Well, speech recognition is one of the prime examples. So if you have like an iPhone 4S and it uses Siri, it probably uses something like a hidden Markov model to do speech recognition, probably a reasonably fancy one. Or if you call your least favorite bank and they tell you to read your social security number back and you have a lot of trouble because you don't, you're not a native speaker, <laughs> Well, thanks to hidden Markov models. As a matter of fact, what's happening there is that the generative model is adjusted for the average American, but the average, well, first-generation immigrant is pretty screwed because the model is not trained for them. Um, quite funnily, it's probably the first-generation immigrants who had quite their hands in building the model, but <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, so optical character recognition is another one. So. For instance, you know, I have some handwritten characters, and I want to find out, you know, what text went into this. Um, so if you go to your bank and you, you know, su submit your check, and you know, at the ATM, and 
then you know you need a system that actually parses the check, figures out you know which amount it is and where it should go to and all that. And usually it's a reasonably fancy in the market model that builds this. Um, gene finding is another popular application. In this case, well, you have you know genetic sequence, and you know you don't really know what the genes are, but I mean they usually have like a start and a stop sequence and all that. And if I just knew what it was, then making sense of what I actually observe would be so much easier. Last but not least, activity recognition. So I don't know who of you have like a Motorola Moto Active or a Nike uh, Fuel or a Fitbit or you know one of the job on up. Any of those devices, for instance, Mac My Right or some other devices on the iPhone, they basically use an accelerometer and maybe also light sensor and various other attributes to determine what you're currently doing. And then based on that activity, I can infer, yeah, okay, maybe this guy is walking right now or maybe he's sitting and doing other things. So this is essentially an activity recognition device and again, I'm trying to make sense of what I'm observing by trying to infer what the underlying activity is. And well, this is actually some of the you know big success stories of machine learning. Here. Now, of course, the question is, you know, how can we do efficient inference? Because you know that's basically the model, right? So we and apologies for the exit and twice being swapped between here and there. So. Basically, for the first latent state, well, you know, I just have to have some assumption of what it behaves like. Then I have a transition model, you know, yi plus one given yi. And then I have an emissions model, p of xi given yi. So this is the same thing as what we had in clustering. And, okay, here's the last guy. So this is basically the entire model that you're you writing out. And we already, you know, figured out that actually integrating out those y's is easy by doing dynamic programming. So we did a lot of generalized distributive law last week, and you just go for it and that's fine. So that allows you to compute the log likelihood of this expression reasonably easily. So the first three y's has to be x's? Um, so as I said, you want to swap, switch the x's and the y's and then you'll be fine. So you either do the substitution here or you do it there. But I just didn't. I apologize, I was too lazy to redo the entire figure here just to, to swap things. That's all. Okay. But you just have to do it in your mind. Yeah. Basically, in case of doubt, go to the mass. Um, so, the log, log likelihood is non-convex, so, well, again, we just use variational approximation. And this is what we already looked at last time, right? So we can upper bound the you know, integrated out log likelihood by so lower bound, because we want to maximize it by the expected log likelihood of now <coughs> the expression where we have you know, both what we observe and what we thought would be the case with respect to some fantasy distribution over what we think might be the case might have the entropy in this fantasy distribution. And then of course, you know, the trick was equality is achieved with q of y is p of y given x, and so we you know, ratchet up by, you know, getting the Q's, then getting P of, you know, you know, and maximizing P of X and Y under that, and we iterate. So, let's see what we actually can do here. So, this is my assumption, my variational approximation, why Q of Y is Q of Y1 times, you know, then Q of YI given YI minus 1. And, well, we can actually get this by dynamic programming, right? My approximation. This is, you know, which one? So let's just no do the standard thing. So let's just write it down. So basically, the good thing is, you know, for p of y one, there isn't that much that we need to do. And sorry. Actually, let's just move right away to the next slide. So that's going to be a little bit more useful. So what we have is we have the expectation of the log likelihood here 
and the y drawn from this q distribution, right? So we can write this out because we know exactly what, you know, log of p of x, y, and theta was, right? So it's basically for the first p of y1 given theta, that term. So let me write it out in its full glory. So we have p of x and y given theta is, well, p of y1 parameterized by theta times the product i going from 1 to sorry, 2 to m p of yi given what i minus 1 parameterized by theta times p of xi given yi and theta and then we also have a p of x1 given y1 and theta. Right. That's our joint likelihood. Okay. Now we take a log of that. So now what happens is we have log of this equals the log of this term plus, here this becomes now a sum, log of this plus log of that plus the log of this term. Right? So far, nothing really special has happened. So now we want to take the Q expectation of the entire expression. Now let's look at the first term here. This only depends on y1, right? Now we know that q of y is going to be q of y1, so goes like q1 times, now here we have the product. Q, uh, going from two, yes yi given yi minus 1. Okay. So what this means is the first term here we can just go for directly, right? So all we need is just the expectation of y1 drawn from q of y1 of you know the log of p of y1 given theta. We know how to compute that. Because we know that this Q is given by exactly, we wanted to set it equal to P of you know, Y given X theta. So I can work out this first distribution. That's just, you know, P of Y1. That gives us this. Now, for the, for this term here, life's also easy. So for that we have just expectation of you know yi drawn from q of yi of generically log p of xi given yi and theta. So that's actually the same thing that we got from clustering, right? So that takes care of this. The only term that's remaining is this object here. So now what we get is the expectation of, well, we have here a yi and a yi minus 1. Right? They're drawn from q of yi, yi minus 1 of, you know, the log, p 
PYI given YI minus 1. Alright? Anybody have, does anybody have questions about this decomposition? It's very straightforward. We're really just plugging in definitions. The good thing is, we know how to compute these quantities by dynamic programming, so I'm not going to go into detail on how you get the Q of twice. That's basically what we did about two weeks ago and also last week again. However, suppose now that we have, you know, a mixture of Gaussians. Well, then we know exactly how to get the means and the variances for the mixture of Gaussians. That, that's what exactly the same equation as what we used for clustering. This is really just, you know, for each instance i, you know, I look at my xi's, look at, you know, what the probability is that it occurred in this cluster y, and I sum up, and this is going to be the effective sample size there for, for that cluster. Now, if I wanted to smooth things, I would add to that, again, my Laplace smoother as I would have done all the time. So this is really straightforward again. So it's exactly the same as what we did when we introduced exponential families, but we just used the Laplace method. For the covariance, again, the same, same thing happens. I just you know, have to weigh things based on you know, the probability of occurrence. That's easy. So the emissions model, basically, how to model xi given yi is unchanged. I mean, you can use the very same code <coughs> to deal with an HMM as you would deal with a mixture of Gaussians. Mind you, rather than emitting, having a Gaussian emissions model, you could have a broad emissions model, right? For instance, if I wanted to do something like a, well, let's say, have a generative model of, you know, entities or how sentence structures and so on go, and then I emit words, then you know this would be word distribution, so these would be multinomials. And then of course I wouldn't necessarily need a Right. So this is easy. Furthermore, the P of Y1, that's also really easy because all I do is I just really compute. You know, P of Y1 given everything else, that becomes Q. So I just plug that right back in. Now the last thing that is um, a little bit more tricky is then, you know, how do we actually get these stars here? So P of Y prime P of Y. The one thing that we made, the one assumption that we made was that the model, so P of Yi plus one given Yi, doesn't actually depend on the i's, on, on the position, right? Now that's a simplifying assumption and that's what allows us to you know, actually use a lot more data than otherwise, but it need not always be the case. Does somebody have an idea where you have something that looks like basically a hidden Markov model, but where this transition probability is not stationary? Yeah, just you know, some data source, any problem where you where you think this doesn't actually hold. In sales at a store. Hmm? Sales at a store wouldn't hold because it's you know quite non uniform how people show up during the day. Another thing is if you for instance do name the entity recognition in a document, you take a news article then news articles are written in a very special form where you know the most important things with all the entities and everything comes first. And then you know the journalist goes and expands and expands and expands. This way you can pretty much stop reading at any time and you will have actually so to say a best guess of what's happened. So therefore the distribution of entities would be non-uniform. Likewise when I start talking there's a good chance that maybe the first two, three words are special insofar as, you know, if I start a new lecture, maybe I'm still searching for words and whatever. So you would have a highly non-uniform distribution over things. 
maybe at some point I get tired and make a lot of grammatical mistakes because I'm not a native speaker, then my transition model would degrade over time after maybe four or five hours of a lecture. At some point I would start making less and less sense. So <laughs> stuff like that would automatically happen in and therefore, you know, there are a lot of cases where this stationary transition assumption is not satisfying. But if it's satisfied, it actually allows us to, you know, simplify things quite a lot. So there are two ways how you can actually see this reasonably efficiently. Um, so let's just pick a particular value of yi. Let's say it was, you know, category one. So y equals one. Then, you know, conditioned on that, we want to get all the other yi plus one. So now here we need to take the expectation over all the yi plus one yi pairs. So let's say we have you know ten states. That's a sum over a hundred tuples. So I basically you know have this matrix. Let's say you know, ten by ten of you know state at position i minus one, and here state at position i, and what I do is I actually go and sum over all those matrices and take basically a big sum over all the i's. And then for each state here, let's say this is state number five, I can go and sum over all those bits. Now what this actually gives me is the probability that, I've, that I'm ever in state number five, right? at position i minus 1, so it's a little bit different when I have a finite sequence length, but okay. So I actually have to sum for i equals 1 to n minus 1. Because after the last point we don't make any other transitions anymore. And now I can basically read off these counts here. And the ratio between these counts and the total weight in this row is exactly what I would be using as my maximum likelihood estimate for estimating whether I, how I transition from state number five into any of the other states. So that's what we have here. This is just, you know, ratio of imperative frequencies, just now generalized, where our counts are not integers anymore, but, you know, just probabilities. That's the only difference that happens. I wrote down here. Okay. Now, if I wanted to smooth things, it's really straightforward. Basically, all I do is I just, you know, take the my empirical ratio and I smooth it by, you know, what prior assumption I have of transitioning from state B to state A, and here's, you know, just a prior count of what I believe the likelihood is that I'm in particular state B. So for instance, if this is a matter of you know estimating whether I have named entities, and let's say these entities never happen to actually be to occur consecutively of each other, then if whenever B is an entity, then N B bar B will be zero, whereas you know N A bar B will be larger than average. So this is one way of encoding prior knowledge if I actually have some of the annotated state. Yep. Can you explain how to compute the first expectation? Is it just empirical count of y1? So the first expectation is just p of y1 given everything else. So now that's exactly what you can do with dynamic programming over a sequence. Remember, we basically and we'll be looking at another dynamic programming expansion later on today, so it's really exactly what we had for simple chain. We do dynamic programming. So when you say everything else, then you mean so every, every uh, yes. other observations. Yeah, so, so uh, well, it, it, everything in the latent state, so basically P of Y1 given the rest would have to be the sum over y2 up to yn of, in this case, p of y 
given x. And if you integrate, if you sum out everything but y1, then you're left with p of y1 given the list. Now typically you're not going to have this expression here. You're going to have something like p of y and x. And then you need to divide by the same sum, but now you sum over all the y's of p of y and x. So it's really nothing that we didn't already do. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, who wants me to just redo the dynamic programming reasoning again, or or who wants me to move on? Should I redo can, it? Can you go back a few slides? Okay, sure. To the illustration of the, the chain. Yes. So why is the observation or the state? So why are the is, is our latent guess of the state? And in some cases, during training, I might actually be lucky enough that I have... So there, there are two ways how you can use an HMM. I might have some data sets where, for instance, I have the Wall Street Journal, and I had somebody actually read the Wall Street Journal to me. And those data sets are ridiculously expensive because I basically need to pay somebody to read a newspaper article. And I need to do that for a large purpose. That's basically how a lot of natural language processing, uh, you know, got started. Um, they then progressed to, well, slightly more interesting corpora in terms of, you know, how applicable they are with more background noise and more natural speaking and all that. But in this case, I actually know, at least for some set, both the x's and the y's, and then only at test time, I don't know the y's and I don't want to estimate it. In some other cases, I just observe the x's and nothing else. And my goal is now to find some interesting structure that's hidden that I can't directly access. So that's then similar to what I might want to do in clustering, namely I might want to know what my clusters actually mean. Here it's basically I want to know what my hidden regimes are. An example might be, let's say I send you to a sleep lab and I want to find out you know, whether there are interesting sleep phases in your sleeping behavior. So I would go and put electrodes on your head and hope that you fall asleep. And then afterwards I run a hidden Markov model on you know, whatever brainwave recordings I get. And it would be quite desirable to find out that maybe there are three, four different phases within your sleep pattern. So that actually turns out to work fairly well. So. That's the two distinctions. In one case, you want to make basically sense and extract structure from something where you don't know what's going on latent. In the other case, you actually have at some point the full annotation, and you just don't have it at this time. So when you do optical character recognition, and I write you know, the word house, then I would argue my handwriting is sufficiently horrible that if I were to erase all of that, right, you would have no way of telling whether this actually amounts to the letter U or the letter N, right? Whereas if you see it in context, it's completely obvious that it means a U. Because the other one is just not a word in the English dictionary. An interesting word of caution in this context. So at some point uh, when the guys at at t Bell Labs built this check reading system that by now I think is has about half the market share. I don't know whether they still do, but at some point they did. Um, they first started by, because on a check you also write the dollar amount in plain English. And that dollar amount in plain English you would think, you know, people are reasonably grammatical and how, how hard can it be to you know, write numbers in English. Um, so they just, you know, used a proper grammar. And they tried it and it failed miserably. So they ended up having to learn the real grammar of Americans writing checks. And that real grammar deviated considerably from the grammar that you would find in, you know, an English textbook. So that's 
So in some cases, uh, make sure you actually have a good model of what your latent state looks like. And it may not necessarily follow what you think it ought to. So that's just a big word of caution. I mean, I know because I was actually in that team when they built it. Okay, good. So can we actually use, you know, things, can we go beyond mixtures? Well, there are, you know, a lot of much fancier things. These could, for instance, have taxonomies. You could get topics, so this is from a nice paper on how to, you know, take images and, you know, annotations, and actually annotate them to this is from a paper of David Bly, or maybe Andrew McCall, I'm not quite sure. Not quite recall anymore, but they, we're actually going to see some of those topic models uh, either today or maybe then after I'm back from. Uh, you know. okay. um, there was a question in the back? Oh, you had a question? Uh, just a, a slide or two ago, it looked like you were about to jump into regular variational inference, but then you didn't yeah. say anything about it. Well, we, we looked at regular variational inference last week. So there we basically looked at the fact that, you know, you want to have a Q distribution, which is as good as you possibly can afford in terms of matching P of Y given X. Right. So let's say this is the distribution that I want to. Well, let, let's yeah. Let's say this is what I want to maximize. Okay. Now, unfortunately, that turns out to be a highly non-convex problem. So, also a log concave problem. So therefore, what I can do is I can come up with a lower bound. Let's say we come up with a lower bound here. And that lower bound maybe happens to be tied there. So this is our Q of Y. And this is our, sorry, not quite. So this curve is parameterized by Q. And the term that, I'm, that I have here is the expectation, the Q expectation of the log of p of x and y, right? With respect to with respect to x, y, and right? So now we say we pick this point here where we say q of y equals p of y given x. Then we go and maximize it, and we end up here. At this point here, we go and say, OK, now let's reevaluate this. Since it's a lower bound, I can only benefit from that. Then we go and pick a new Q distribution. Let's say Q prime of Y is now P of Y given X and theta prime. So here was theta, here's theta prime. And then I, you know, might get a much tighter lower bound. And I maximize this again. And I keep on doing it until I sufficiently well converge. That's really the idea of a variational approach. Now, in some cases, this Q distribution may not be perfectly computable anymore. So the Q distribution itself may be already so complicated that you can't really work it out anymore. An example of that is in a in latent Dirichlet location, um, you know, the joint distribution over the topics and you know the genetic model and all that is sufficiently unpleasant that you have to make actually a very well a specific structured approximation of it, and then you just solve for that, in which case you don't necessarily get this tightness here anymore. Right? So you are going to have a gap here between where you are and where you ought to be. And then you maximize this, you go up, 
and you get another upper bound which now has a gap in it. So it doesn't necessarily guarantee anymore that you will converge to a local maximum. So in other words, this method has very weak guarantees. Nonetheless, it's extremely useful in practice. And a little bit of the black art is how do you make meaningful approximations of this P of Y given X by some Q distribution that doesn't throw out the baby with the bathwater. So for instance, the approximation that Q of Y is the product over I QI of YI, so all those guys are independent of each other. This is sometimes known as the mean field approximation. So whenever you hear mean field, which sounds really fancy and hey, we're using some terms from physics and so on, that's all it means. Structured mean field and variational EM, yeah, it's basically what's happening here where we come up with something that's a little bit it has more structure than just, you know, everything being independent. And, yeah. So, whenever you hear those terms, don't be scared. What we're going to do next, though, is we'll take a bit of a detour and look at sampling. The reason why we're going to look at sampling is because, actually, at scale, sampling beats variational methods. Now, this is something that, apparently, in academia, nobody really seems to get. And there's a consistent stream of papers claiming that they have very fast variational algorithms, but actually sampling really beats them at scale. So let me explain to you why this is the case. And I hope that in two, three years, uh, this will become you know, more commonly understood and known and accepted. But let me quickly explain to you what's going on. Let's just go back to clustering, because that already shows Let's say we want to cluster documents. So a document has maybe about, let's say, between 100 to 1,000 words. And let's pick something interesting. Let's say we have maybe 10K clusters. Now, if I were to do EM, so remember we basically had to compute the weight of a document for, with respect to each of those clusters, and then do a small update. Now, if I have 10,000 clusters, there's a good chance that almost all of them are pretty boring and do nothing but just add computational cost for the cluster that I'm interested in, right? For the document that I'm interested in. So most clusters will be about something that's completely unrelated to the document. Yet, I need to compute my QI of YI, right? Now, this is going to be a vector of, you know, 10,000 floating point numbers. Actually, I only need 9,999, but fine. Okay, so that's basically 40 kilobytes in float. Okay, that's a real problem, because our document weighs in at something in the order of two kilobytes. So, the first problem. The second problem is that now I need to actually update my sufficient statistics, right? So I need to compute the sum over QI of YI of Y times XI. I need to do the sum for all y in the set going from 1 up to 10,000. And this is going to cost me 10,000 times, okay, let's say, 100, right? Okay, so this is basically one million updates. So already here I can see that it costs me one megaflop to do all the operations. Actually it's two <coughs> megaflops because you have to multiply and add. But you know this is substantial. And 
you have to store about 40 kilobytes here. Furthermore, if you use MapReduce for it, you're completely lost because now each document, which you know weighed maybe two kilobytes, will generate 10,000 times two kilobytes. So each document will generate something or 20 megabytes of data. So, in other words, you take your original data set, which might be a gigabyte, you multiply it by 10,000, and all of a sudden we are talking about 10 terabytes of data being generated at each MapReduce stage. This is going to wreak havoc on your data center. So, you just cannot implement it. So therefore, when you see all those, we use variational at scale, look at the number of categories, the amount of structure that they use, and you will almost always find that, yes, and we use 20 to 50 to maybe 100 different classes, and yeah, that's when the algorithm works, and as soon as you push it up to a scale where you should be as you get more data, it completely falls over. So, be careful about the fine print there. Um, now let's just compare what happens if we were to do sampling. And I'll explain sampling to you in the next few slides. So don't worry. So, if we were to do sampling, well, we still need to draw from that distribution. And that's a story for a different day of how you can do it efficiently. And trust me, you can basically you use a very fast approximation of inner products, which if you I mean, if you've heard of local locality sensitive hashing, you would you would have seen already one of the techniques to attack this problem. But now, in this case, well, rather than 40 kilobytes in float, we have 10,000 clusters, two bytes will do, right? So we have 40 kilobytes versus two bytes for sampling. The update here is going to be, well, two times a hundred words. Well, why twice? Because I need to downdate the previous cluster, I need to update this one if I do it incrementally. So now we are talking about, you know, 200 updates. So one million versus 200. Furthermore, my network traffic, if I had one gigabyte of data, is now two gigabytes as opposed to 10 terabytes. Two gigabytes is something that I probably don't even need many machines for that. And so this is why if you use sampling, you can actually get you know, many orders of magnitude computational savings and push up things at scale. So this is something that, you would, that, is, that runs very counter to the intuition of what you usually hear when you hear people talking about graphical models. Yep? How do they get Well, I'm saying, well, we have 10,000 clusters, so we need, a, need to store an integer between 1 and 10,000, and 2 bytes will do. If you want to store it as an int, you need 4 bytes. But I don't even need 4 bytes, I can get away with 2. But Yes. And that's just because you're just sampling one particular cluster. Correct. Correct. So the net result of that, of course, is that the estimates will be a little bit more noisy, but if you have a very large data set, that doesn't really matter because concentration of measure kicks in, and so the population average that you get over your documents is actually well behaved. That doesn't necessarily mean that the particular cluster that you draw, drew for a particular document is the most likely cluster assignment. It's a different story. But at least for inference purposes, this is unbeatably much faster. Yep. And then where is the sort of threshold in terms of the amount of data you need in order to start seeing differences there? Um, for concentration of measurement? Like that? Well, it's a very good question. Um, what you do get in interesting large problems is that you're almost invariably in the regime where sampling is going to be necessary to even get anywhere. So um, the exact threshold is something which at the moment nobody has really worked out in a lot of detail yet. That would be actually a very nice theoretical result to obtain. Um, so 
if you want to work on this, this is, I mean, I'll be delighted if somebody, you know, works on it, figures it out right now. I mean, this is, this would actually be quite a valuable result. I mean, there are some results on, you know, of course, reliabilities of samples and so on, but what's happening here is, if you have a large number of very similar objects, like, for instance, many users or many documents or whatever, then the <coughs> averaging process that you get by, you know, taking an average over all the documents, which are not independent of each other, they're exchangeable but not independent, but they're almost independent. So you ought to be able to do something useful there. Um, unfortunately, I haven't been able to use, you know, concentration of measure bounds such as make the armies self-bounding inequalities and so on for that purpose yet. But maybe somebody else can figure it out. Um, so that's basically why sampling is really the method of choice on very large data sets. Um, so as a horrible example of what not to do, um, somebody a couple of months ago interviewed at Yahoo um, and basically he was building some factorization model for documents and he used parallelization, MapReduce and basically his algorithm you know, topped out at maybe 10 million documents or so and basically during the interview I had him calculate how long it would take on a single machine on his laptop as opposed to MapReduce and the number was lower than what he it took him to <coughs> paralyze it. So <laughs> paralyzation is not always the solution to your problems. Um, it should never be used if the single machine implementation is faster. <laughs> uh, I mean, it sounds like a no-brainer. Um, just make sure you don't fall into this trap. And I've seen this happen several times. Yep. Just to clarify what you say. You say constant or concentration of measure. You mean one constant. Uh, so can you just repeat the last so phrase? You said concentration uh, of measure. Yes. When you have a lot of data, then concentration of measure kicks in. Yeah. But uh, what you meant the concentration of the qualities, or, or yes, correct. Yes, that's what I mean. So, for instance, if I have you know half a billion users, and each of them do something, and I have an annotation for each activity with a likely topic, then rather than you know summing over all events you know p of you know, you know let's say cluster id you know y given x times s i right i will sum over you know the y's drawn from y i drawn from p of y given x i and so what you can see if i goes let's say from 1 to you know maybe 1 you know 500 million then this quantity is going to be very close very close to sum over i going from 1 to 500 million uh, to just y i equals y times x under reasonable assumptions this is going to be the case. So when I have very large averages, <coughs> sampling is going to be indistinguishable from these. Furthermore, if I use variational methods, I'm going to make horrible approximations in quite a few cases to my true distribution. So whereas with sampling I can actually draw from the true thing, with variational, I have to approximate. And then I might actually get something that's computationally very costly and doesn't actually reflect the truth very well. So this is why you're rather better off in some cases to sample, especially for large problems. I think here's a good point where to take a break. This is five o'clock already. And then let's have a short five minutes break and we move on to the next part.